folks, welcome to the Seven Figure Network Podcast. My name is Melford Bibbins, and today I'm joined by James Lenhart. And you guys know that my favorite interviews are ones that start about an hour before I hit the go button. And that's exactly what's been happening. I swear, James and I have probably been talking for 45 minutes with such gold that you guys didn't get a chance to hear because I didn't hit the record button yet. So now we're gonna let you guys in on this super high level conversation we've been having. It's just been such a blast for me to teach, to, to talk to uh, James because we have very similar thought patterns as to how not only the industry is evolving, but what needs to be done in the near future to keep us moving in the right direction. So first and foremost, James, thanks so much for being on me. I, I so appreciate you being here. Well, thank you so much for having me on here. And, and it is funny, in the last 45 minutes, if you had the record button on, I think half of it we had to edit out. <laughs> but we're, we're both, we're both tri-staters, so we, we tend to talk a little fast and, <laughs> and probably most people wouldn't be able to keep up with it. But I, I am very excited to just share a little bit of what I've seen in the industry over the last 22 years and from like all different facets of network marketing. It hasn't just been in the field or at corporate or as a branding consultant. Like I've done all little different things. And so just like a diamond, talk about diamonds, right? Because uh, that's like the top position in every network marketing company on the planet. Uh, you know, there's so many facets to this industry. Mm -hmm. And I think most people might only see one or maybe two or three. I've seen so many different weird little angles of this of this industry uh, that I get to uh, provide a, a different a different outlook on where we've been and kind of where we're going. So I'm excited to uh, just chat with you. We've already had a blast already. So oh, that's great, man. Thank you so much. It's uh, and and the audience knows how much we love having guys on with who have experience like you. You know, who who spent time on the executive side, has spent time consulting these companies, has spent time coaching and building the top of companies. I mean, <clears throat> I just love to have. Have the insight of somebody like you. So I, I got to ask the most obvious first question, what got you into network marketing in the very first place? Like what made you swipe your credit card that very first time? Yeah. So the, the, the real short story for me, I was a dog trainer for about seven years, uh, way back in my, my youth. So I've trained thousands of dogs and I loved the ability to be able to go make money by doing something I had fun at. So train dogs, make money. And then somebody, it's like the old adage, right? They, they came and knocked on my door and my neighbor knocked on my door. She said, hey, you know, I know we don't talk that much, but I'd love to show you what I'm doing and I'm getting trained for this new position. Would you be able to help me out? Sure. What time? Well, is now good? Sure, now's good. And she came, she went out oh, back across her street to where she lived and she came back with this very portly uh, Greek guy and I won't name any names, but a really cool guy. Uh, he came and I'm like, Okay, I got into that like second look of like, this is what we're doing. Okay, sure, I'll, I'll run with it. And at this time, you know, I was making six figures, doing dog training, loved what I was doing. So I'm not looking for anything. And they sat down and they, you know, took out the flip chart and started doing this flip chart. And I'm like, oh, this is interesting. The information was good, got to the end, and uh, basically said, so what do you think? That's what he said. And I said, oh, it's interesting. How do I get involved? And I said, oh, you want to buy the product? I was like, no, no, no how do you want to do what she's doing? Because in the presentation, you said she's going to make money doing what she's doing and she's not doing anything. You're doing all the work. How do I do that? And I said, well, we've got a meeting on Saturday morning, come down and blah, blah. And that, so that was like 20 ish years ago. And so I went down to the office. I was at that company for six years and, and learned what network marketing was. And I said, this is a place that you can go at the time, I don't use this language today, uh, at the time where you can make rock star money and not be a rock star. You know, you can go and say, hey, I, I'm, if Melford en enrolled me into a company, he could be someone that makes multiple six or seven figures. And his one and only goal is to get me to make six or seven figures. And that doesn't exist in the industry, whether you're a doctor, a lawyer, like they're all kind of sharks out there trying to eat each other up and, and edge each other out. In network marketing, it was like, hey, wait a minute, you actually want me to do better than you. And, th and that's when I went into that road. And then I also went down the personal growth route. I was with Tony Robbins for like six years. And so it's always this like constant, ever improving thing that I always saw as a journey, not like, oh, I'm going to get into network marketing and make lots of money. I got into network marketing and go, wow, I can learn how these guys and girls that know how to do this, they're willing to teach me. I'm I'm a sponge. Let's rock and roll. And so for a couple of years in, in the middle of my network marketing career, I just kind of 
traveled the world and would sit in rooms and just listen. And I remember, uh, I won't, I won't name any names, but a really big network marketer that's kind of retired now. He does more training and everything. I remember being in a, a room in Las Vegas and he was in the front of the room. He was like, yeah, I just decided that I wanted a house in every or house in every time zone, a car and a, uh, 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 all my clothes. So a, a full wardrobe in every single time zone. And I made that possible within 10 years of my career. And I'm like, sign me up. I'm in. If I could get half that, that'd be kind of cool. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of how I originally got into it was really just to learn from people that said, I will teach you uh, and I'm not going to charge you for it. And my goal is to get you to do it faster than me. I was like, I'm in. Let's let's just sit in the room and absorb because as a dog trainer, I was I was not absorbing that information. Yeah, gotcha. Hey, uh, last week, I, do you know Christian Peters? You might I think it sounds really familiar. The great guy, but the, the reason I'm raising Christian is because I interviewed him last week, and his big thing was, you know, I don't care about the product. I don't care about the results. I care about teaching people about an opportunity that's going to change their lives. Yeah. So now, that's obviously how you got into the industry. Did you sort of, and again, I, I found it amazing. I'm like, wow, that's impressive because the guy's killing it, and he's just teaching people about the opportunity. So I found it right. super interesting. Did you transition from, okay, pure opportunity to now the product matters a little bit more, or has it always just been the drive of this opportunity is so amazing? that we know the products are going to be good or else the company wouldn't have launched. Can, can you go into that for a little bit for me? To explain yeah, I think I've gone through like kind of ups and downs mm-hmm. throughout my career because I've done service-based, I've done product-based, I've done a lot of different things. And I, I think the product does have to be good. Uh, do I have to say it's a life-changing, altering product that's going to change the world? Not, not necessarily because I can have an incredible product. If I love this pencil I'm holding in my hand, and I, and I take it every day and it changes my life, that also doesn't mean I need to build a business around it. So I think over the years, I've shifted back and forth between product and business. And now I look more at culture and community. So like, if I love this pencil, what's the culture and community that's around it that's trying to sell this pencil? What's the executive team like? What's the culture of that company like? Do I want to partner with that culture and the brand? Because I had a branding and marketing agency for a few years I'm more about the brand and how it makes people feel and what they see when they look at the brand versus the product and all that kind of stuff. Because I'm one of the people that the second that someone buys the product, I go, now that you've started the business, let's get you started. Not wait for the product to arrive, try the product, make sure it's good, all that kind of stuff. And that's in that gap of I ordered today, I received my product. That's where culture lives. Because how do you onboard somebody? How do they get into the groups? What do they feel like? Do they have confidence immediately to go, oh, I'm going to share this with my best friend, or I'm going to share this with another person? Do they have that instant confidence, or do they need the product or the money, the opportunity to give them that confidence? Mm. I think the culture is where you can get that confidence really quickly. And I think some companies have that. Some companies really miss the mark and they they depend on the product experience or they depend on the opportunity to get people excited and confident to actually go out there and share. Mm, that's a really good point. That, that flip-flops a little weird sometimes. Yeah. <clears throat> Let's talk about uh, lead generation right now. And it's, we're going to go in like 400 different paths. Okay. So I'm just like, <laughs> after, the, after the conversation you and I had for the first 45 minutes, I have like 500,000 different questions I want to go on. So right. I'll try and keep it fairly linear. Um, one thing I want to talk to you about is, is lead generation right now? Because I mean, A, obviously after 22 years in the industry, playing both sides of the fence, knowing basically every big trainer in the world and going through every system, what do you feel like today is a really great way to build your network marketing company? And and, and, it, if, and I'd like, if you don't mind, can you answer from two different points? One yeah. is the newbie and one is somebody who's established, but it's kind of hitting that weird zone where they're either going to delve into management mode and start going downhill, <laughs> or they're going to keep growing like a maniac. So could, could you talk about both sides of that coin of lead generation today? Yeah, let's start. Let's start newbie first. Please. So because whenever I do consulting or where I come into any company or friends are just asking me about companies, I'm always like, what does it feel like to be a new person first? Because a lot of companies focus on like recognition and bonuses and all this stuff for the top brass. The thing about the top brass and network marketing companies is they're going to do it no matter what you give them. Uh, Cause that's just their, how they, how they feel. Uh, and that's what they're going to go after a new person. You need to put that first dollar in their pocket. You need to do all these different things that gets them to want to go out and get leads 
because I'm a, I'm an old schooler. So, you know, if I'm in a company, the first thing I'm going to do is you make your list of 100 people, uh, make your list of 100 people and go ask those people, can they give you feedback? Because I think one of the biggest things that newbies, people in the industry, like in the first, their, their first company or maybe the first few companies that have been with, associated with a few over the last 20 years, the, their thing is that they get so excited about the product, they get so excited about the opportunity, they just feel like they need to share it with everybody. I'm like, that's great. But in this day and age, that's how people feel about everything online, that everyone wants something from them. I want your information. I want your money. I want, 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 want. All I want you to do is make that list of 100 people. And then who are the people that are on that list now that you could go to them and ask them for feedback on something, ask for their opinion. Like they'd be open to just watching something and seeing if they like it. And if they don't like it, you're still friends. If they do like it, you can send them more tools. And so that's the biggest thing I think that that hump that newbies, new people have to get over is this is not about going out and sharing your product and your business. It's about going out and just getting feedback about something you are excited about. And if they say no, great, we're still buddies. And that's how you can go through numbers really fast because I think this whole adage in the industry where it's like, oh, you don't want to spam. Yet numbers and spam are not the same thing. Spam is throw your link out everywhere, throw your product up on your social media. That's spam. Contacting a lot of people for feedback is not spam because the the number 1001 person that asked for feedback doesn't know the person number 20 that I asked for feedback. They just know that I'm asking them personally for their opinion on something. So that's lead generation for me. I'm a little old school in that way, but it really is because you don't need everybody. You only need a few people to go, yeah, I really like that concept. And then what are they going to do? Well, they're going to go make their list of 100 people and teach people to go ask for feedback on that too. Uh, And so that's from the new person, from the veteran I think a veteran can take the same angle, but they can do a little bit more of a business spin to it, where it's not just like a project or like something I'm I'm excited about. I can go to Melford and be like, Melford, I know we've known each other for a long time and I really respect your your opinion and feedback on things because you know we've talked. I really respect how you've you know built your businesses and what you've done over the years. I would love your feedback. I'd love for you to poke some holes. In what I'm about to go do, would you be open to poking some holes and seeing what's wrong with this before I dive in? Because someone like Melford, he's respected and he goes, yeah, listen, I want to save you if it looks wrong. So let me look at it. Because I've had people that I've said that to and they're like, no, I'm not like another leader. I say, and they go, I'm not into network marketing. I'm retired. I'm like, I totally understand you're retired. Could you just tell me if this is not a good idea? And they'll go, sure, I'll tell you if it's not a good idea. I wouldn't do that with a new person because they don't have that credibility built up where they would be able to go that. So it's kind of the same idea of feedback, but the language and the posture is a little different versus a new person where they're really just wanting to get feedback from everybody in their life versus the veteran that is kind of targeting certain people to go, hey, if, if this person, I'm not looking to recruit them away from a company either. I'm not looking for them to jump and leave or whatever it is. I just want them to see it. From me first, maybe down the road, there could be partnership in some way, shape, or form. Uh, And that's the whole thing is I was always trained, just get eyeballs on it. That's your job. Your job is not to sell the product or the opportunity. It's just for people to look at it, and then you get out of the way and let them decide what they want to do with it. Yeah, no, I I love that. I I love the fact that you took sort of a, a classic model but made it so it still feels good for everybody. Cause you know, again, we were, we were talking for so long beforehand about, you know, the evolution of the industry and, and, you, you know, obviously you put the ball in the tee for me when you said B2B <laughs> cause you know, <laughs> seven figure network, all these are all around, you know, enrolling businesses, but you know, a couple of the other markets that are, that are really perfect right now that have been sadly avoided by this industry, men, you know, yeah. that's, that's a marvelous way to, to approach men. And, you know, why are men hard to get? Because oftentimes network marketing didn't have a system in place for success. Right. You know, and, and again, the last thing I'm trying to be is sexist. I mean, you guys know we're in an industry of 95% women. So I'd right. shoot myself in the head if I was being sexist. But the point is, is that men who could be hyper successful in network marketing have avoided it often in the past because they only were told to make a list of 100. 
Right. There, there was no evolution. Like you just gave the evolution. You told, you know, what do you do in the beginning? What do you do in the middle? Obviously, we both know once you hit the top of the pay plan, you do entirely different stuff from there. So you've got a different mechanism in place. <laughs> but having this available, it's like uh, harkens back to the Blue Ocean Strategy. I mean, it's a, a book that I love and I'm sure you love too. Yeah. You know, why do we keep throwing ourselves in this red ocean of doing the same thing over and over again when there's men out there that are perfect for network marketing but have never been approached or approached badly? Time to get them in. Transitioning professionals. You know, how many people out there, like if you spend more than two minutes on LinkedIn, everybody's looking for a job right now. Yeah. Like the most talented people on the planet are sick of going into offices right now. Could this, I mean, I'm, I'm going to, I'm sort of asking you this as a, as a silly question, but is there a better time ever for network marketing than we've had right now? There really isn't. I mean, again, when I've looked at the industry over the last 20 plus years, the best time for network marketing is the worst time in the economy or the most unstable time. Cause that's when everyone opens and they're like, sure, I'll take a look at anything. We'll generate a dollar. I'm in like, let me, let me look at it. The, the, when things are really good and the market's good and everyone loves the everything on the planet. It's like, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Mm -hmm. Because again, network marketing is a game of numbers. I mean, Jim Rohn is my, is my guy. Like he's my, my go-to. And, and so, you know, Jim Rohn's like, Hey, listen, this, this is not, this is a numbers game. It's a ratio game. If you do things long enough, a ratio will appear. And in a, in an unstable economy or things that are, you can go through more numbers to get more people to say yes, because they said they're open and more people are open. So what you said about guys too, is that I think men and women too, but men go, you know, for me too, I look at my, my, my past and I'm like, I didn't know anything about skincare. I'm not a, a leggings person. I was in a leggings company for a while, but the, I, I understood the, the the concept of the business. I understood, you know, skincare is a really good business to be in. You know, clothing a really good business to be in. Do I really have a skincare regimen? No, I wash my face and that's about it. Um, but I understand that's a multi-billion-dollar market. Same with weight loss. I'm not a huge weight loss fan but it's a multi-billion dollar market. Mm -hmm. The question is, is what's the culture? What's the community? What's all those different things that are wrapped around that? And you, like that goes back to, do you need to love the product? Yeah, you need to like the product. It needs to be a, a good product that's in the marketplace, mm -hmm. but do you need to be the, the target market for the product? I don't think you do. I, I don't need to be a, a skincare guy what do, they, what do they call a metrosexual guy? I don't need to be a skincare guy uh, in order to understand skincare. I can understand the market for skincare. Mm -hmm. And that's where if you go after somebody like a, a professional looking for another opportunity, uh, just anybody that would give opinion right now is the best time to go, hey, are you open to other ways of making money right now? Yeah, I am. Great. Watch this video. Join this group. Whatever that next step is for you in your company. Mm -hmm. I, I love, I'm so happy that you said that the fact that you've been in companies that you were not the prototypical person. Because <laughs> I mean, again, you and I were joking around about this, you know, 265 pound powerlifting Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt, not exactly your average oil guy. No. <laughs> you know, but, you know when, when we went into our company, it was like, it was all oil, you know, I mean, quote unquote, oil hippies and the whole deal. And then my wife and I, you know, hyper athletes show up and we're like, because we knew that it was applicable to people. Right. It, didn't, it didn't matter to us that the persona was this, the stereotype was that we cared about the fact that is this product going to impact lives? And for us, is it going to impact them at a clinical level? Is it going to impact to the point where we feel comfortable bringing this into health-based businesses and using it? And that was what started the seven figure network in the first place. And there's so many other companies out there that are like that. You know, well, and, like, that and that's what you said too, because what you guys saw, you saw the brand, yeah. you saw the, the professionalism of the brand you were, you were going with, because there's, there's other companies that have oils and stuff like that, but it's the branding of you're like, oh, this brand can be represented in the market. Yeah. And you know, that's why I love branding and marketing because mm -hmm. the original brand, how the word brand came up is what they used to put on cattle. That's the brand of the cattle. Uh, and now brands are like Nike and, and Apple and all that kind of stuff. But that's what you are. And that's the, the, the key phrase today, right? In network marketing is you're the brand. Nah, you are the brand. But you're also partnering with a brand mm -hmm. and that brand's going to reflect on you of the kind of person you are and what you're doing. And you can absolutely actually borrow their brand to elevate your own if it's a good brand. If it's not a good brand and they need a lot of work, it, it'll never elevate you. And so even when you get around people and mentors, you're like, 
are you operating at a higher level? One, one of uh, the people I really respect in the industry, Ray, uh, he did a, a whole training on yesterday. He's like, when you wake up in the morning, do you visualize the person that's at a higher level than you? And are you trying to go to that level? And it's this idea that, again, you know, the whole the old adage, right? The, the five people you surround yourself with the most is who you'll become. That's true. But who are you visualizing yourself to become at a higher level? Because you don't have to be friends with them. That's what I've done over the last 20 years. I'll get in a company and I'll go, oh, there's the person that's at the top. There's the person that knows what they're doing. My first question is, how can I go add value to that person so I can sit next to them while they're doing their thing? And that's how I learned network marketing was, how can I add value, maybe build a PowerPoint, maybe put together a graphic or whatever it is. And I just added value. That's what brought me into a branding and marketing agency was now people are like, hey, you're that guy. Can you do that for me? I'm uh, sure. And so it really snowballs into that. But if you're in network marketing, understand that you're in brand marketing. You're marketing that brand in a way that you could be using your brand to market said brand, but they are together. You are coupled to whatever brand you, you decide to partner with. You, you just dropped a sexy little platinum nugget and just root, rip right by it for anybody noticed. <clears throat> Make sure when you're in your company, you find somebody that's high rank and find a way to help them out. Yeah. It, it, that's such a that's such a smart tactic because, I mean, you're both giving and receiving. And, and then let's be honest with you, if you've got nothing to give, then maybe it's not the right time to talk to that person. Or yet. or or go learn something that you could give. Yes. Go, right. Go take a course, go read a book and be like, oh, what could I give? I don't know. Let me go read this book or that book. And, and that's what led me to executive consulting because I was like, well, if I can make this give value to leaders mm. and I can sit next to them, what would happen if I gave value to executives, which helped the entire company? And, and would that be of influence? Would that allow me to learn things that I couldn't learn from the person in the field? And that's that's what I've done over the last couple of years is sat next to executives. And when you can see the whole thing, how everyone does it, then you get a whole different perspective of how network marketing actually really is. I think that's one of the reasons why I'm one of the only podcasts that loves having executives on. <laughs> Probably. Because <laughs> I because I want to hear it. I want to yeah. hear what's going on. You know, it's like, I want to know what, what levers Oz is flipping. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because you're never going to, I mean, you can talk to every master distributor in the world. They don't know what's going on. They think yeah. they do. But, yeah. you know, if, if you're not behind that gr that glass door, you're not knowing everything that's going on. It's, it's wonderful to have that. So, so first and foremost, I want to thank you because you gave action steps. Yeah. So, you know, I, I always want to make sure that we give people action steps to follow. And then I always like to talk about a little theory because I want people to start thinking about the, the ideas for themselves. Let's talk about compliance. That We talked oh. about compliance for about 20 minutes before we, before we hit the go button Be, because we both know how important it is, A, to what's going on and to everybody at every level, but B, it is truly the future of the industry. And it, it's I'm, I'm stealing the words out of your mouth by saying that. Um, you know, we're very compliance biased because we work in B2B environments. You right. know, the seven-figure network has to be hyper-compliant because we deal with doctors, nurses, you know, health professionals, gyms, spas, pe people's lives lives are dependent on right. us being both hyper clinical and hyper comp um, compliant because their life is their business. You know, if, if you want, if you say, okay, here you go, I'm going to do my little two second pitch. Guys, if you sign up a business, especially a medically based business, and you don't provide them with everything that's clinical and compliant, that's their license on the line. This is how they feed their kids. This is how they pay for their house. This could be their first practice. And they, just, they could have hundreds of thousands of dollars with the school uh, bills. They could have all this tuition just waiting to be paid. And you bring one incompliant thing in there and putting their license on the line. Horrible. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, JMC. That's why we love you. Because <laughs> you get it so much. So that was my my quick little um, public service announcement. Please be hyper compliant when you're dealing with professionals. So please, James, I, I, I want to hear it from your mouth. Why do you think compliance is the future of this industry? Well, and you said it too, on the clinical level, why it's so important for you to be compliant with a doctor, because they have a medical license, they could lose that medical license that could do a lot of damage. And it's because they're not provided with the tools they need. <clears throat> On the flip side, that's also how you should treat every person that comes in. Because when you have a, 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 ma, a mom at home, has four kids, uh, two jobs, and she comes in and she goes, I'm going to pair with this business, you're putting her reputation as a mom in her community on the line and again, I go back, I get goosebumps when I think about it, you know, some training out there, it's like, you are a sponsor. You have a responsibility to that person, not just to make money off them, talk about the product, blah, blah, blah. 
you have a responsibility to protect their brand and their reputation because that's what they're entrusting you with. Because, I mean, let's face it, to get involved in a network marketing company, what's the most? $1,000 could probably be the most you would pay for a pack or whatever. You know, so you're not talking a lot of money investment. We're not even talking a lot of time investment. What, maybe an hour, two hours a day? What people are investing is they're investing their list, their network, their reputation with you as the sponsor. And I don't think people take that seriously enough because as I, I go back to the company that I first enrolled with, and I think this is where I got it from, was when I sat down with that person and they said, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna write your list. So you come to the list, right? Back in the day, they would have a triplicate list, right? They'd have a white copy, a yellow copy, and a pink copy. Well, you'd write your list of 100 people, I think it was 100, and you'd write them homeowner, blah, blah, blah. And then they go, okay, great, James, here's your copy. And then here's your sponsor's copy. And then here's my copy as the person that owns the office. And they'd go, so here's what happens, James, now that we've done this little exercise. Now, most likely you're going to fail and never do this business. When that happens, we're going to contact the people on your list to see if we can add value to them. Oh, okay. That's why I didn't leave that company for six years because I didn't want them to do that. But that's that instilled me in this idea of this ownership of the list of, when you come to a network marketing company, you are bringing your list. That's the value you bring, especially with a doctor. And so why I believe that compliance is literally the future of network marketing, it sounds like a good book title. Uh, the reason it's, it's such the future is because those are the things that can get companies shut down, just like you can get a doctor's office shut down. So let's you know take this back to a couple of companies that have happened to this over the last two years. You know, people that are making multiple six, seven figure earners, been with the company for a long time. Their background is, you know, they were an engineer that made 50,000 a year. Now they make half a million a year. And that company comes out and goes, hey, guys, it's not working out. They're threatening to shut us down. So we're going to have to end this. And uh, you're going to have to figure this out on your own. Because of compliance. Because they didn't think compliance was important. That put them at the risk of their company being shut down by some little tiny thing, not anything huge, because in reality, all the, the official agencies, all the three-letter agencies, we will not name now, but all those agencies, they don't really understand how network marketing works internally. They only see what's on the outside. And so they'll see like medical claims or this or that or whatever, and they'll take that and then they'll threaten the company and the company will go, either they'll cave and they're out or they'll fight and something will happen. And so why compliance is so important, when you come into a company, not only are you risking your brand, you're risking the brand and reputation of everyone that comes on board. So you have to be compliant. You have to have buffers in place, which is why I said when we do lead generation, hey, I want your feedback. Not, oh my gosh, this product cured this or helped me with that. I don't even tell people what it's done for me. I let all the other stories do the work because, again, never risk your friendship. I don't care how awesome your company is. Don't risk a friendship. Don't risk a relationship on a company because um, I've learned over the years that company could be, oh, my God, it's incredible. And then three months later, it's gone. Uh, and so you really want to outlast companies with your relationships. And I've learned the hard way how not to do that and how to do that because I've risked relationships with companies um, and lost. They're not only that, not my, not my friends, they don't like me because I got them in the company that failed them 12 months later. Um, and so that's the biggest thing is really kind of going and why do I want to be compliant is because it's I'm risking my brand and the reputation and brand of every single person I sponsor inside of that if the compliance is not protected, and when we talk about compliance, if you're if you're new on here, compliance is compliance is really just about giving promises that you can't fulfill, and so that could be promises of what your product does, the promises of what your business does, even what your system does. If I get on social media and I go, "Oh my gosh, our team is rocking it. We're making millions of dollars. We're doing awesome," and if you come in this system, you don't have to do anything, and it's done for you. You just put you your company, and everyone at risk because you just made a promise of what would happen if they came into your business. And right there, one of those three-letter agencies could see that video and go, your company's out of compliance. Here's your letter. How are you going to resolve it? And so that's why I think compliance is really the future of network marketing because without regular, whether internal regulation on our part, it will just get shut down over the next 10 to 20 years because 
franchising, like we talked about, you know, franchising was illegal at one time, right? And they created this whole franchising program. I don't think that can ever really happen with network marketing because there's so many different companies, comp plans, executives, leaders. There's no way to really regulate it and go, this is how you do it. Everyone does it differently. But there is the chance that it all gets shut down Mm -hmm. uh, because the government could come in and be like, hey, listen, we don't know what's going on with you guys. Well, you just can't do this anymore. And, And they'll just start shutting it down left and right. Will that ever happen? I don't know. But hey, if we just take some real simple steps and say, hey, you can't post this. Post it like that. When I was a dog trainer, it wasn't about what to get your dog not to do. It was about teaching the dog what to do. If you're an, an executive listening to this podcast or a top income owner and your, cor- your corporate executives don't make graphics for you and recognition and PDFs and clinical trials and all that stuff, you're at risk because a network marketer, an entrepreneur like me comes into your company, I'm going to go make it. And it's probably not going to be compliant. And so it's the it's the role of the company to create those things for the people in the field so they can go and be compliant and do business correctly and not put anybody's reputation at, a, at risk. So that's why I would say, you know, compliance is the future of network marketing, even though it's not a cool, sexy, awesome topic to talk about. Everyone wants to talk about recruiting and social media and da 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 you can do all the recruiting and all the influencer enrollment and all that stuff. But if your company is not compliant, you don't have teeth in your compliance department. Mm-hmm. Man, none of that other stuff matters. You can have a million leads coming down, but you can still get shut down in a heartbeat without you know any, any way to get out of it. So make sure compliance is tight before you build anything on top of that. Compliance isn't cool and sexy, but being open tomorrow is. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah. That so, true. so, dude, now we got to flip the coin on this thing because we've been talking about compliance and enrollership. Yeah. How about, uh, well, well, we'll take it even deeper. How about retention? So I want to know, you know, old schooler, been in a bunch of companies, you know, you've got a big fat brain. I know, you know, a bunch of different tricks, but that in com- in um running in conjunction with right. compliance, because obviously, I mean, that's, that's again, one of the most penultimate importances of compliance is keeping your team compliant. So you actually still have a team to, to work with. So can we talk about retention for a minute? Yeah. So I think retention does couple with compliance too, because, you know, one of the things that companies have had a problem with is internal consumption, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, you've got, you know, let's just use an easy number, 10,000 distributors and zero customers or a thousand customers. And so you're all your customers are your distributors. And that becomes wrong in some eyes of government agencies because they're like, well, if I sign up to do a business to make money and all I do is spend money on the product every month, then at the end of the year, I'm in a negative for my business. Even if I never intended to do the business, I just signed up for the discount or the culture, whatever it is, I'm in a negative because I spent money every day. So then they go, oh, that's, that's illegal. Can't do that. I, I totally get that. And so one of the things about retention is there's a couple of companies out there that have come over, out over the last, I would say, five, six years that really understand customer retention and the importance of why do we need real customers that want to buy real products every month and, ha- and never, ever want to touch the business side? And if they choose to, maybe they could get points or something like that. So I think the biggest thing on retention side is creating a customer program that keeps people customers and doesn't try to convince them why they need to go become distributors. Uh, Because I think a lot of programs out there that'll go, okay, you're a customer, but hey, Malford, would it just be better if you made money too? Doesn't that be awesome? Here, buy this pack and now you can make money. And you're like, all right, yeah, that makes sense. I like to make money, sure. And I like the product, I'll I'll do that. And so there's no line between customer and distributor. Like if you go on Amazon right now, Amazon didn't sell their own products and talk to a couple of years ago, because Amazon was built of distributors of all different products. Now, no one really knew that. They all thought it was Amazon. I bought, I buy it from Amazon, it comes to Amazon box. I got it from Amazon. Well, no, you probably got it from Joe Smith that's selling products in Indiana and carting them from China over to here and repackaging them at the Amazon plant and sending it to you. And he makes people proud for that. There's millionaires, many, many millionaires that have Amazon stores. And so that idea of what Amazon is like is really where the network marketing model needs to go to, where it's like in network marketing, we would kind of like highlight and put the distributor up front. They're like, oh my gosh, you get the trips and the recognition and the woo, 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 all that stuff. You really want to do that for the customer. You want to make a retention program that rewards the customer, 
that might be a program that's not even available to the distributor. So for example, let, let's talk about travel. Travel is a huge thing you could use for loyalty. Let's say you have a travel company that you could partner with and go, hey, you know, as a customer, every dollar you spend, you get a point to use towards travel. When you're a distributor, you don't get that option. Oh, oh wait, but what do you mean? Yeah, because that's for our customers only. That's for our loyal customers to do that. So attaching things to going, when you do a dollar, you get a point. Or I know a lot of companies out there too, there's a few that I could name, but a lot of companies will, you know, for every uh, $10 you spend, we'll donate a dollar to such and such charity. So making it more, that there's more value in the 10, the dollar that that customer is spending, just like why a distributor would buy products. Why am I a distributor? Why do I buy products every month? Yes, I love the products, but also so I can get paid. That's the, one of the driving forces to buying products every month. For the customer, the driving force has to be more than the product or the price. Because if I'm just a customer and I'm paying you know, 50 bucks a month for my product, and I go over and I see another product for $42, I'm customer, I'm going to go buy the $42 product. There's nothing keeping me there. But if I'm spending $50 and I know, you know $5 a month goes to a charity, and I know that $50 every month, I get points towards this. And so kind of combining the Amazon worlds and like the credit card rewards program worlds and making that some real customer loyalty retention programs, but making them exclusive for customers that you don't get when you become a distributor because you really want them to stay as a customer and keep it happy there and not have this, this idea of, oh, you need to upgrade. Oh, you need to be part of the cool kids. No, no, no. The cool kids are the customers. And that's where I think one of the next phases, and some have done this, but not really big yet. I think that's where you start bringing customers on trips. So like you take distributors, you bring them on trips and you extravagant stuff and paid for vacations and blah, blah, blah. But what if you had a customer program that after a year of being a customer for a, a, a company, you brought them on your next trip? Hmm. Or say, hey, you have a free hotel and everything. All you got to do is get there and pay for your travel. And we'll give you a free vacation when you get there. And now they're around all the distributors in your company. Go, wow, this company culture is really cool. And now you just probably recruited your next top income earner in your company from being a customer for a year. Companies don't think like that. They think, how do we get, the, how do we get people in today? No, how, how do you convert a customer lifetime into a distributor that becomes a customer gatherer because they were a really great customer experience. So those are a couple of ideas in terms of, of retention, just making it really special for the customer and not making it like, ah, uh, like, cause one of the trainers I heard a while ago was like, you know, you go after people and you present the opportunity and you lose if they become a customer. Oh, I don't know if I like that. Uh, cause it's like the, the, what is it? The, the second place prize is for them to be a customer. I really think in our day and age, in the future of network marketing, is customer is first. So it becomes a linear thing. It's not a lateral thing. I don't go, well, well, Melford, do you want to be a customer? Eh, not fun. Or a distributor? Really fun. You want to do B? B is better. A, B, B. And they're trying to get everyone to do B versus going, hey, Melford, here's how it starts, man. We have you, we want you to enjoy the product. Buy the product first. If you love the product, refer some friends, get some points, get some free products go through that process and have this linear progress from customer to distributor versus an A, B choice. Uh, now, of course, people are going to come in and just go right through the business to B, but you want people to run on that path of a customer-centric experience because what are they going to do? They're going to then go get customers. So you're training customer gatherers. There's a few companies that you'd mentioned in our discussion that, that do that really well. It's a customer retention program of why you want to be a customer with these awesome products, not why do you want to be a salesperson? Uh, that's not the angle you want to go with. So retention program, focus on customers, give them special benefits that maybe even the distributor doesn't have access to. James, that is genius. I, I love having a hyper-focused incentive program for the customers. Yeah. I mean, that, that just doesn't exist. That's so smart. Like we could just turn off right now. And that would be like that. <laughs> <Do that. laughs> and you just became the smartest guy in the industry. <laughs> That's such a great plan, man. I love that. So are, are you seeing it? And again, we, we talked about a couple of customer, uh, companies out there doing it. Do you see that happening in some of these companies over the next couple of years? Because I mean, it just seems like such a no brainer to, I mean, my Lord, incentivizing customers for even a small percentage of a, of a vacation. Phenomenal. Especially yeah, I think today. 
I mean, I think a lot of companies I've seen, because again, when I do consulting, I'm, a, I'm the kind of person that like, I, I'm a compensation plan junkie. You know, I've got a folder on my computer that has like 95 compensation plans in it. Uh, companies that, are, that were around for six months, six years ago and not around, but I keep them in a little folder. Uh, mm-hmm. So they have that history on my folder. I have a legacy compensation plan folder in there. And the thing about it is there's, there's so many good things in the industry that I borrow things from all these other companies. And so I'm in like every group on the sun. I buy products from everybody. If you've got a product, let me know about it. I'll probably buy a pack. Um, <laughs> Cause again, I just want to know, I want to see the box. I want to see how it's presented. I want to see how, what's your onboarding process. When do you email people, all that kind of stuff. And, and it really comes down to what you want to experience and how you want people to feel during that process of becoming part of your company. That's really what it comes down to mm-hmm. is how does it make me feel to be part of this thing? And that's, I hate to bring up, I can bring it up because it's no G company. You know, that's what Amway did when you were an Amway, most people and in network marketing and outside of network marketing became millionaire billionaires because they were exposed to Amway in some way, shape or form, either from the culture, tape of the month club, whatever your opinion is on that, whatever it is, but they were exposed to this culture that said, Hey, you can be a better person Mm -hmm. and you can be a better person by learning how to do stuff. And that's really what it comes down to is it's having that idea that the companies that I see out there that are doing things that are very customer centric. Like I know a lot of companies out there, uh, there's some hair care companies, some, some skincare companies that have like VIP programs for customers that are like, Hey, if you do this VIP membership and you know, you'll get free points in the month and then you'll have access to free things. So I do see the shift of newer companies. Now, older companies, eh, they're not really getting the hint. Uh, And that's where those companies that are not getting the hint, they become the product of the month company. Mm-hmm. They think retention in future is look at this product, look at this product, mm-hmm. this product, this product, this product, this product. And you're like, I don't even know what you guys do anymore. I just know you have like 5,000 products. And so it's this idea of really being centric and going, hey, how can we do this? So I see some VIP programs out there, some point based programs, some things that I'm drawing from and going, how can you do that for the customer and then the real part timer? I think that's been missed a lot too in network marketing where it's like all about, you know, here's my million dollar check. Here's my nine trips I took and I speak on stage around the world. And you're like, I don't know if the average person can do that. And the thing about it is that you have the whole, I mean, Larry Thompson is, is a good, a good example. The 80, 20, the 80, 15, five rule. That's what it is. What it comes down to is that 80% of the people that are coming to your business, they just want to be there and be in a culture, maybe make a couple hundred bucks. But most language of companies is make a million dollars, be a six figure in or join the diamond club. It's like, that's so unrelatable. Mm-hmm. Whereas like that's what social media has done for influencers, right? Because back in the day, back in the day, right now, for to be an influencer, you had to be a rock star, a celebrity. Now, what do you have to do? Go get a TikTok account and go get a million followers, celebrity. And so that idea of it being around this top income earner, you really want to cater your language to customers and part-timers because that's what people are looking for right now. They're not looking to leave their teaching job. They're not looking to not be a lawyer anymore or a doctor anymore, but they are looking to go, Hey, how can I invest an hour, two hours, three hours a week and add an extra 500 bucks, thousand bucks a month, you know, get another car. Now that was one of the things that Jim Rohn always said, right? You know, I don't want to leave my part, my, my full-time job because I had such a great story. Cause I would, you know, I have, I have a car. I didn't want to leave that. It was such a great story. And so you don't want to try to grip people out of their story, meet them where they are, not where you want them to be. Go, hey, what do you need for me? Like we talked about before, you know, going into a doctor's office. Hey, what do you guys need? How can I help? What value can I add? You know, what's your day like? Where's your gaps? Where can I fill that? Can I come in here and help you guys out? I'll I'll stuff some folders for you. Need help? I'll stuff some folders for you. And that's what it really comes down to is finding those gaps for people and going, how can we fill that gap? Not how can I make you a million dollars a year? How can I make you an extra $300 every single month that you don't think about that comes in? Mm -hmm. That's what you want to do because what's the only option? You can't do that in the bank. You're going to go buy real estate. There's lots of ways you can do real estate. But in network marketing, it's still the best opportunity for you to come in and just make 500 bucks a month that comes in every Mm -hmm. single month. But that comes back to compliance and culture (laughs) and retention programs and all those. If those things aren't in place, you don't have an opportunity for the 80 percenter. The 80 percenter of the person that goes, hey, I only have an hour a week. If you don't have systems for them to use, your your company is not 
set up for the future. Yep. Set your company up for the customers and the 80 percenter, and you're you're going to have a company that's going to be around in 20 years from now. Yeah. Hey, man, I'm, I'm so glad that you mentioned the old schoolers because, okay, anybody who picks on Herbalife or Amway does right. not understand what network marketing is about. Nope. You, you know, <laughs> if, if, they're, if, if any one of those two companies is the butt of your joke, you don't get it. And you mentioned Larry. Larry's such a great, like, I love Larry Thompson. He's such a great guy. And it's like, how did guys like that, how did masters like that build this, you know, hundreds, I mean, God knows how much those guys made, but like, just teaching people how to make a couple bucks. Yeah. You know, that's why Herbalife did so well, guys. That's why Amway did so well and why they're still around. I yeah. mean, for the love of God, they're still around 78 years later because they're not trying to remove people. They're right. trying to plug into their lives. And that's, and that, again, that's what we talk to business owners about. We are not trying to change your business. We're right. just trying to add in a very profitable Lego piece. Yep. Here's the glue, the system that allows that Lego piece to get stuck there and not have you ever worry about it again. Right. Like to us, that's the way this thing works. And so it's really just an evolution of what started this industry in the first place. We yeah. just do it for business as opposed to individuals. So I'm so glad that you mentioned those two. Hey, uh, do me fair. Um, how can people reach you personally? I, I, you've given so much awesome content. How can people find you? So, I mean, I have a website, jamesletheart.com, that you can go on there. That was kind of my my old branding and marketing website. I had a duplicate mastermind and all this kind of stuff. But that's how you can reach out to me because, I mean, the biggest thing that I look at right now is, you know, I could have gone down the coaching realm and all that kind of stuff. I really love impacting at a very high level. I love doing executive stuff where I can come in. And as of right now, like the things that I bring to companies it's not my opinion. It's not like, hey, this is what I want to do. It's like, here's just the science of what would happen if you do this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. If you don't do this, here's what will happen. Like if you let your dog run around in the house, it's going to pee all over the place. That's just what's going to happen. If you put your dog in a crate and you crate train them and you do all this stuff, here's what's going to happen. It's an equation. That's what I learned mm -hmm. as a dog trainer. Yeah. Dog training is not a mystical, magical thing that happens. It's a, it's a series of decisions that you teach the dog. Mm -hmm. And so same thing in network marketing. It's a series of decisions that you teach somebody, here's how you do this, and here's the result of that. It's not mystical, which is what I think in network marketing, especially with social media, because everyone is an influencer now, mm -hmm. with social media, it makes everyone have this instant voice where it's like, maybe you should just go crack open a Jim Rohn book. Yeah. Maybe you should just go wonder why why does Herbalife still do use talk demo that Larry Thompson created, you know, 32 years ago? Yeah. Why is that? Because foundationally strong, you don't use social media to build your business. You use social media to build your list and your network that can potentially build your business. Mm -hmm. And so it's all these concepts that that's really what I love focusing on. So I don't really do individual coaching anymore. I do more executive stuff. Uh, but again, I'm always a person that I love masterminding and reaching out and doing anything on that realm and just really talking to professionals. Like this is why I, when we when we jammed a little bit on Facebook Messenger the, uh, last week on Friday, I went back and forth a couple of times. I'm like, yes, I'm in because it's it's value based. It's not, hey, come buy my book, come buy my course, blah, blah, blah. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Let me put that out there. Nothing wrong with books and courses. But it's this value that if this industry is going to survive, we all have to have this idea that we're not enemies of each other. We have to have this idea that I'm in company A and I don't like you because you're in company B. Like, no, that's like if a dentist was like, I hate other dentists. Like, no, that's like the science, right? Well, then you're an anti-dentite, right? But that's the thing is that you, you, you love your industry and you learn from everybody. That's why like people that are in the industry that have created really great network marketing events mm -hmm. are so successful because people want to learn from other people. So I would just encourage you mastermind with those people, find somebody that you can learn from and go, I'm going to learn from that. If you don't know anybody, I wouldn't even look in your company. I would go back and look at what's happened over the last 30 years and go dive into Jim Rohn, go dive into things that are never going to change. You know, the sun is always going to rise on that side and set on that side. It's just how it's going to be. When you introduce a, a concept to somebody, their first reaction is always going to be to push back. Well, how do you overcome that? Ask them for their advice, their feedback. Uh, uh, Jim Rohn, ask them to be your first no. 
You just need them to say no. Please just say no. I need five of those to do this. Um, you can just be one of the people that say no to me. That'd be great. Uh, and that's kind of the, the idea about this. So that's how you can reach out to me, jameslenhart.com. Uh, but I'm always open to masterminding and, and chatting about these topics. As you can probably tell, we could probably do this for another hour or two. So <laughs> I'll leave there. Yeah, we, we, I'm pretty sure we could talk for six hours. And the yeah. best part is everybody be on the edge of their seat because we're going to talk about cool <laughs> stuff for six hours. <laughs> we're, 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 we're not going to be talking about the weather. We're going to be talking yeah. about cool stuff. So, but because we both have stuff to do and I'm not going to take your next five hours away from you. Um, I got to ask you, what is your six month goal? So six month goal for me in terms of from a, a professional goal is a best selling author is kind of where we're going over the next couple of months. Uh, so I'm looking to get back again, where can I add the most value? And so executive level book level, that's really where we're focusing on the next six months is really how do we add value at a, at a larger level in small ways, yeah. not like, you know, existential, like change the world thing. I'm just, how do we get a broader audience mm -hmm. and really teach people, Hey, here's how you build a community that would lead to something. I don't know what that something is, but here's mm -hmm. how you build a community. Cause that's, I mean, you look at social media and Facebook and all those different things. That's where everything is going. Yes. These little communities where we're kind of getting back to the heart of like actually talking to humans. Uh, I think over the last two years, people have, have really gone, to, we need human interaction. That's why depression rates are sky high and all those different things because a lack of human interaction. And we were already on that trajectory. And then what happened over the last two years just skyrocketed it up to what it would have been 10 years from now. But now we're experiencing a short time. So that's kind of my goal is really to do more of a value based with books and things that don't cost a lot of money that the average network marketer goes, Hey, listen, I just want to make a couple hundred bucks a month and then see where this goes or the seasoned network marketer goes, Hey, listen, I I'm tired of this game of, of company hopping and stuff like that. How do I really evaluate a company and go, Hey, let me ask the hard questions. Like what's your compliance department look like? Oh, uh, we don't have one. Well, okay. Next company. Thanks. Like, so that's the kind of thing that I really want to focus on the next six months is doing books and, and things around how to add value to the, the part-timer and then really the seasoned networker to really kind of go, this is how I pick a company, not because of hype, because of the next great pencil that came on the market, uh, but really a real reason behind as I would go do a franchise. You know, when you go, I want to go build a franchise, you look at their books, you look at everything. There's so much research. You don't just go, hey, McDonald's, here's $1.2 million that I can have six of your stores. Like that, you don't do that. You, you really kind of dive into it. And that's how I think seasoned professionals have to have a responsibility to go, hey, what am I actually doing? Whose reputation am I putting on the line? And, and probably now I probably coined my next book or ebook, maybe uh, compliance is the future of network marketing. So maybe that'll be in the works too. Uh, no, that's so great, man. Thank you so much for being on today. It's, uh, you know, I, I just, we delivered so much value in this time. So, so that was your first step. You've already delivered. I don't even know how long we've been on for at least an hour, but you've yeah. delivered an hour of value to this audience. And it's value that a lot of folks haven't thought about. You know, there's just, we talked about a lot of stuff that's sort of outside the strat of most, 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 uh, yeah. most folks talk about. Sorry about that. And I'm excited to see what this next six months is going to do for you. You and I are buddies now, so I'm super yeah. excited. I mean, I don't even know what you and I are going to do. We're stuck <laughs> with each other now. We're done. <laughs> so we're perfect. So, hey, James Leinhardt, thanks so much for being on today, but I really appreciate it. And I know a lot of people are going to reach out to you today. So I hope that uh, server's ready because awesome. <laughs> they're going to be pinging it. <laughs> Thank you so much, man. Thank you for your time. Thank you, compadre. Have a great day. Bye. Hey there. I hope you really enjoyed the show. And now I have a question to ask. Do you want to know how to build a seven-figure network with just three to five enrollments a month? That's just three to five conversations, not 30 to 50. That means we only have to convince three to five people to say yes to build a real seven-figure network. Scan the code or click the link at the bottom of this page now to discover the step-by-step -step method for exactly how you can add hundreds, if not thousands of customers to your downline by recruiting and enrolling businesses and health professionals onto your team that have hundreds of built-in customers that need your product or opportunity. Get the Seven Figure Network book now and let's start building massive volume with an enormous downline of businesses, health professionals, and customers.